Good afternoon. <clears throat> I'm Katie Cottingham, and welcome to this news briefing from the 251st National Meeting and Exposition of the American Chemical Society in San Diego. We're joined today by Dr. Jehan Marku from Americans for Safe Access and Melissa Wilcox from Grace Discovery Sciences. They will be talking to us today about measuring cannabinoid dosage in marijuana munchies. Dr. Marku? Uh, yes, so currently in the United States, over one million qualified individuals can access medical cannabis. There are 40 states that have passed some sort of cannabis access program. Um, uh, one of the leading um, efforts to help promote product safety has been the American Herbal Pharmacopeia's cannabis monograph, which outlines standards of identity and analysis, including quality control limits. While it does have analytical methodology in it, it doesn't address how to analyze complex matrices, such as food products that are infused with cannabis. In an effort to begin this discussion and address uh, this analytical issue in the cannabis uh, world, we have held our first symposiums with the CAN subdivision at American Chemical Society. We had three symposiums inviting uh, such speakers as Mahmoud El Soli from the University of Mississippi, who runs the Cannabis uh, Federal Marijuana Grow as well as several other prominent researchers. And we've also held a training symposium on cannabis extraction and analysis uh, last Friday. Um, and part of the problem, I guess, with analyzing these edibles is that, you know, your typical HPLC equipment was never ever designed with the intention of injecting a cookie or a brownie into it. And those can wreak havoc on your columns and shut down your systems. Okay, Melissa? So uh, we formed a collaborative research team to work on developing a better method for analyzing uh, cannabis-infused edibles and topical products. And we thought the best way to go about it was really to isolate the cannabinoids away from all of the other components in the product matrix so that you would take clean cannabinoid fractions to your HPLC to, for your analysis piece. And in order to do that, we coupled um, a front-end sample prep technique called cryo-milling, where you freeze the sample. We mixed it with a little bit of um, fluffy silica called sea light to keep it a free-flowing powder, uh, put it on a flash chromatography system, and basically did an online extraction of the product, which we were able to successfully isolate the cannabinoids away from all of the sugar and fat dyes and salt, every, anything that was in the edible that might interfere with the quantification on HPLC. And then we took those clean cannabinoid fractions to HPLC and injected those, and were able to get more accurate results than if we had done a more traditional liquid-liquid extraction, which is typically done on the plant material itself, with great success. Um, and so, you know, that that's really the gist of our, our method and what we set out to do. And some of the next steps for us is going to be um, looking at method validation, uh, determining recoveries, and things like that as a next step. OK, so do we have any questions? Kath? <laughs> Thank you. Hi, it's Kath O'Driscoll from Chemistry and Industry magazine. Just to ask, is the problem uh, more to do with the fact that people are um, deliberately mislabeling the amounts of ingredients, the amounts of products, uh, of, of cannabinoids in their products? Or is it that these analytical techniques are giving uh, erroneous results? I think it's, it's a number of, of issues. I don't think anyone is deliberately um, trying to mislabel their products. I think when the samples are sent to testing labs, the testing labs may not have the right methods to be able to analyze these products accurately. And edible products are being developed at a rapid pace. So these cannabis testing labs may see a new product come through their door you know, as often as once a week. And so every new product may be another method development project for them. And most labs are not gonna have the staff um, to do that, to do all of that method development work. 
And just to add, you know, the, the situation isn't, you know, so simple as just a machine not giving them the right results. It also has to do with the Schedule One status of cannabis, how it can be, you know, legal in the state and still at a federal level it is prohibited, which means that you cannot obtain analytical grade standards. You can only get quick checks, which come in one mig per mil vials and actually tend to vary <laughs> somewhat between batch to batch. And so if you're trying to analyze a method, you can't just buy one vial that has 10 mils of solution. You have to buy 10 individual one mig per mil solutions, which means that it is extremely expensive and time consuming for laboratories to, one, develop new methods, to calibrate equipment, uh, and things like that. And so, you know, hopefully one of the things that may help is considering rescheduling of cannabis just to allow product safety to be more effective. Okay. Uh, and also just to ask how much more accurate is this method than the traditional sort of HPLC methods? I don't think we're able to give you an absolute number on that uh, at this point because we haven't done our, you know, uh, comparison studies and, and determine the accuracy and precision and recovery and all of that. Um, so I don't think I can give you a number on that now. In a theoretical sense, it, it should be much more accurate, especially for the very difficult sample types like a gummy bear. Um, you know, we have people dropping a gummy bear in a beaker full of solvent and sonicating it, and we all know that solvent's never going to get to the middle of the gummy bear. So it's not going to be uh, fully extracting all the cannabinoid from the product. And so, you know, in our method where we pulverize it, we create all that open surface area so it is getting fully extracted. So theoretically, we know it's better. We just don't know quantitatively how much better yet. So do you think there's a problem at the moment? I mean, could there be products out there that contain really high levels of some of these products that are actually? Yeah, and there, and there has been some work done on that. Ryan Vandry um, published in, journal, in JAMA, right? Yeah, at the end out of, of last John year. Hopkins University. And he did that work in collaboration with a cannabis testing laboratory called The Workshop in Seattle, which is a just strictly a cannabis testing facility. Um, and they found that 17, that what they did was they went to um, dispensaries in three different states and they bought a bunch of edible products, brought them back, tested them. They found 17% of the products were accurately labeled with how much THC they contained. 20% uh, were low and 60% were high, had more THC than what was on the label. And, and despite these labeling issues, um, there are there have been a number of recalls in states like Colorado. So despite um, this study, there is product safety in effect and public, the public health is being protected because we do see the implementation of recall plans based on adverse events reporting or, um, for instance, uh, there was recently a giant recall in Colorado due to concerns over a pesticide, but upon further analysis, it realized that it was not um, in violation of the quality control regulations. Okay, Doug. Uh, Doc Dollamore, uh, ACS Office of Public Affairs. You just mentioned public safety, and those of us of a certain, I guess my question is going to be about the, the dosage, is those of us of a certain age, uh, when we were uh, experimenting, let's say, you know, we, we would just go, oh boy, brownies. Uh, why is uh, the dosage a concern with edibles? Well, if you're a medical patient and you're um, trying to establish a certain dose that works to treat whatever condition you're using it for, it's really important for that person to know, you know what the accurate dose is so that they can continue to treat themselves with that same accurate dose, um, especially if they're using you know, different products or trying different products. And it's important for them also that if they are using the same thing over and over, that that product is consistent from that manufacturer. Okay, other questions in the back? We have one. And let's go to the back first. Back. Yeah. 
Um, cost was mentioned as a factor before in um, current labs that are running these measurement tests. Um, how does your technique compare in cost, and do you think it's possible to scale it up so that all these samples can be tested in a timely fashion? Uh, we haven't done a full uh, cost analysis, and what the what makes that difficult is if the liquid liquid extraction, you know, the typical way something is extracted doesn't work. You know, you could compare the cost of doing a liquid liquid extraction, but you wouldn't do it that way because it doesn't work. So, I, you know, we can say, all right, with the liquid liquid, you're going to use a whole bunch of uh, chlorinated solvent because you're going to have to use a lot of it to extract it. Um, and then look at what's required with our method, it, you know, less solvent, but maybe some consumables that you may not need with a liquid-liquid extraction. Uh, but short answer is we haven't done that cost analysis yet. But I think it's an important component because if the cannabis testing lab is going to use it, it has to be cost-effective for them. Okay, Bela. Bela Buslig, Officer of Public Affairs. Uh, let me play the, uh, the devil's advocate here. Uh, here. Uh, analytical methodology in general, uh, in general aims to, uh, to be very accurate and, uh, and very useful. How does uh, uh, comparing, uh, comparing uh, standard methodology, let, let's say, as applied to FDA or, or, or an industrial lab, uh, affect all this, uh, all this thing. Uh, take, uh, take any kind of psychoactive compound like alcohol. Uh, it's a whole lot harder to, uh, to analyze a, a, a sweet, syrupy uh, a liquor as, as opposed to vodka. Uh, Anybody can analyze vodka by GC. Uh, you can't exactly uh, inject a, a, a liquor into a GC because you come up the, uh, the inlet fast. Uh, why not try to standardize the methodology, keeping accuracy in mind? Because psychoactive compounds are, 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 are of course, uh, a social problem, not, uh, not, <laughs> not, uh, not a medical problem. Um, and so your, so your question is about, you know, standardizing analytical techniques. Standardizing. Yeah. And so there have been efforts to do this, but also the, the regulations around cannabis uh, in terms of testing requirements are much, uh, we say much, there's a lot more expected than of alcohol. Alcohol, it's alcohol percentage. In the cannabis plant, many states require at least half a dozen active ingredients, many of which you cannot, if you use GC to analyze them, they convert into other compounds. So for instance, THC actually occurs predominantly in the plant as THC acid, as a carboxylic acid. Um, and so if you analyze it by HPLC, you'll get a different no set of numbers and then if you analyze it by GC. And states are expecting multiple compounds. And the amount of THC also does not directly reflect how potent the product is because if there's a significant amount of cannabidiol, it has been clinically proven that it will inhibit, if not completely abate, the um, psychoactive properties of THC. Um, and there is a clinical product called Sativex out there which has a one-to-one -one ratio of THC to CBD and there is virtually no um, you know, adverse events reported with this medicine in relation to psychoactive effects. So basically, how does this dif differ from analyzing, let's say, a pesticide in a food product uh, <laughs> as opposed to, uh, to something that's psychoactive? Uh, active. You're still looking for accuracy at, 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 right. at reproducibility. I think the, the, the chemical complexity of the fact that it's a plant and it's a natural product and there's, you know, what, 300, 400 different compounds in cannabis. There's a, a 110 cannabinoids that have been identified. There's probably an equal number of terpenes, flavonoids, carbohydrates, all sorts of stuff in the plant. And the resinous um, globules that contain the cannabinoids, that also kind of adds some more complexity. And um, in one of our talks today in the symposium, 
uh, somebody was talking about how they were trying to develop a method for pesticides and validate the method, and they were using trim, which is more like the leaf parts uh, of the plant to use as their blank matrix, and they were spiking and everything worked fine, but then they, they used the flower, the buds, spiked that, all of a sudden didn't work anymore because they think of the, you know, the complexity with the resin on the buds. Well, what that, that's basically where I'm coming from. I spent most of uh, my lifetime analyzing citrus products. And there's nothing much more complex than the, that you'll find, uh, find the various uh, <laughs> citrus products. So it, uh, accuracy and, 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 and reproducibility is paramount. Uh, so you basically have to standard the, the, the method. So uh, the FDA uh, results will be identical to, to yours, or, or at least close enough to, uh, uh, for government yeah. work. Um. <laughs> so uh, unfortunately, I think a lot of those um, government organizations that could provide help and guidance um, to this industry in general are staying out of it at the moment because of the federal Schedule I status of cannabis. And, you know, I think if, if those agencies were allowed to help and guide that I think we'd all be better off. But at the moment, they're staying out of it completely. You know, and even growers, they could really benefit from the USDA and giving them guidance on um, cultivation and pesticides and all sorts of things. But again, they're staying out of it at this point as well. And, and, that, and just to drive home that point, if you have a DEA license, you cannot bring in any materials that are not coming from a licensed DEA source. So you could have a wonderful testing facility with a DEA license and all these standards, but you'd be completely prohibited from going to you know a legal commercialized market and bringing those products into your lab. So you know that's part. Of, yeah. It's, yeah, that's it's that's actually we're running out of time. Thank you so much for joining us at this press conference, and the archived version of this session will soon be posted at bitly slash ACS Live San Diego. Please join us for our next press conference today at two o'clock on a pill that could improve breast cancer diagnoses. Thank you.